everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode. And today on Hot La Mode, we are going to be getting into one of the most iconic fashion shows to date because yes, this is the second fashion analysis video. And today we're gonna to be getting into the Versace Fall Winter 1991 collection. It's very important, not just for fashion sake, but also because honestly, it's when four regular schmegular little models turned into supermodels. But before we get any further into the video, if you guys are looking for a channel that talks about fashion in the most fun, sassy, bitchy, analytical way, this is it. So you can go down below, hit the subscribe button and turn on my post notifications. I mean like, what do you have to lose? You're already here. And if you guys wanna see more from me, you can follow me on any of my social medias down here in the links below. I have Instagram, Twitter, Depop. And also I run a fashion podcast with my friend Darnell Jamal called the Fashion Victims Podcast, where we talk about fashion news and gossip weekly. So check it out. So let's get into this show. I'll be honest, I'm not a crazy Versace fan at all. Maybe you could tell that from my show reviews or my reviews of the Versace dresses that often show up on the red carpet. I think it's important that we recognize that I only lived through about five months of Gianni Versace's career before he was tragically murdered. And unfortunately, I'm not gonna be talking about the whole murder situation because I am not Ryan Murphy. That's it. I've only known about the Donatella Versace era of the brand, which in reality does make it hard to be able to see the true genius Gianni was and what the Versace brand actually stood for because no offense to Donatella if you're watching, babe, you're not that great. But before I get too sentimental about Gianni, let's do a bit of catch up on him just so we're all on the same page. Gianni Versace grew up in Reggio Calabria, Italy with his father, mother, and two siblings, Santo and Donatella, if you were wondering. His mother, Franca, was a dressmaker and Gianni grew up around her studio and eventually took on an apprenticeship there where he worked alongside the other seamstresses. We love a man who can intern. He, like many other great designers of this time period, honed his skills in draping, cutting, sewing, and tailoring. His mother saw his talents as a designer and decided to foil her husband's plans of sending Gianni off to be a corporate drone and instead send him to Italy's fashion capital, Milan. Gianni was a great networker and eventually landed himself three design gigs working for Italian knitwear brands looking for a new direction. So he and his brother Santo wrote up some very lucrative contracts for these multiple Italian clothing manufacturers and got to work selling his own designs under the label. Labels. But eventually Gianni wanted to create his own brand and Versace was born in 1978 under his own boutique, which may be a good place to start discussing this collection. In his book, Signatures, Gianni describes the very first memory of fashion that he has as a black velvet dress, which could be the reason the first look from the collection is this black cocktail dress, which is shaped by a signature oversized gold buckle belt. The black tights matched with the patent leather knee-high boots are oozing with BDSM and fetishism, which Gianni had no problem showcasing and citing as inspiration. You'll realize that Gianni really does not give a singular fadoodle. As Versace was unabashedly always looking to modern culture for inspiration, I should also mention the first half of this collection is actually haute couture. Maybe in these black sexed up styles, it's hard to tell as first I genuinely thought it was ready to wear, but in reality, Gianni was recognized by the Chambre Syndicale de Haute Couture as an official haute couturier. Good for him. Much to the chagrin of the French. Linda Evangelista continued to open the show with platinum blonde hair, which suited her beautifully and could have easily been a reference to Gianni's earliest muse, his younger sister Donatella. If you don't know, Linda is said to be the chameleon of the runway. She could pull off any look. Speaking of Donatella's highlights, she'd been bleaching her hair platinum blonde from a very young age with the help of her older brother Gianni. Then came a belted t-shirt dress with similar stylings. On Claudia Schiffer, there was a deep plunging jumpsuit, which was signature Versace seduction. By this 1991 collection, Gianni Versace had been designing for over 10 years, starting with being a creative for other brands, as we already mentioned, but eventually starting his own label. So when planning out the next stages of the Versace brand, Gianni orchestrated this rich, over-the-top, and sex-fueled aesthetic that began to be easily associated with his work and the 1990s in general. It also fit in with a stereotype that was often placed on the Versace clan. Seeing as how Gianni, Santo, and Donatella were all from the south of Italy, they were often looked down upon by the Milanese, 
who consider themselves far more sophisticated because of their northern Italian roots. So this déclassé aesthetic of deep plunging necklines and tight seductive bodysuits matched the Versace branding to a T, at least in the 1990s. Next came Cindy Crawford in another cat suit, this time with halter neckline and keyhole cutout, and then an off-the-shoulder black dress was on Stephanie Seymour. Notice that I'm talking a lot about the models. These are the supers of the world. So yeah, normally I don't ever talk about models, but here it's important. Then the collection got a whole lot more colorful as was typical Versace style. Chrissy Turlington strutted out in an orange fai baby doll dress with pumped up hair and the same black boots. The dress was quite hot stay at home wife, which could have easily been a customer Gianni was trying to reach out to because it's said that every single season, Gianni was looking to a new woman to inspire his work. And of course, Naomi Campbell stormed the runway in a blue offshoot of Christie's dress with thick straps and a sharp and pointy neckline. Then a slew of wool looks in the same bright colors popped in with matching PVC boots. These looks are where the couture starts to really come to the forefront. These layered skirts with these short crop jackets fed both the conservative woman, but also the fashionista core customer of Versace. While many of the French were skeptical of an Italian doing couture, these bright colorful styles are impeccable. Chef's kiss. And not a thread is out of place. And seeing as how this was the winding down of the 1980s power suit, Gianni was just giving it one last little hurrah. He was like, listen, I helped make it. I can help kill it. It's not the same for Casey Anthony. Both wool and Fi today would hardly be called sexy, but the models who included mega famous names such as Christy Turlington and Naomi Campbell commanded attention and sex factor, and that's how you know they were good at their jobs. Here's the thing. In the late 1980s, models like Linda Evangelista and Cindy Crawford were being shot more and more for major print magazines like Vogue, which at that point was actually a big deal because normally runway models only walked runway and editorial models stayed in front of the camera lens. Nowadays, it's just a poppycock, a, a, a mishmash, a, 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 a microwave leftovers of this experience. And very few models could actually command such attention on and off the runway. But those two, as well as Naomi Campbell and Christy Turlington, were starting to be labeled as supermodels. Gianni had seen that these girls commanded attention with their fierce sex appeal, but also their Amazonian womanness, and he realized that they could camouflage to embody any garment that they wore. Gianni was a lover of history ever since he was a little boy playing in the Roman ruins that surrounded his hometown, and he understood that fashion needed to be a reflection of culture, and these girls were becoming the faces of the 1990s, and Gianni knew he had to have Versace also be part of that cultural moment. The man was a brilliant genius. Then came the kimono style looks in bright colors mixed with black in wools. Cindy Crawford wore a muted cerulean wide sleeved and belted kimono dress with black PVC boots, while the next two looks were reciprocals of each other in black and yellow kimono jackets. Today, we discuss the idea of cultural appropriation. And while this could have been deemed that, the pieces do reflect the Versace brand, but only seem to utilize the silhouette of a kimono and not the fabric or traditional elements of a true kimono. Gianni also was one of the first people to mention that fashion should have accepted Japanese designers prior to the coming of Rei Kawakubo and Yoji Yamamoto, so he was always an ally. Gianni often pulled from many different historical reference points, but he never did so with malice. It was always appreciative, but wanting to reinvent the styles or artworks so that they felt modern for his customer. Then came three tailored coats with monochromatic pleated skirts in blue, pink, and yellow. Gianni had become quite well known for his catwalk tactic, which had been to send multiple models down the runway at once in different looks of a similar style. It was almost almost like he had created his own runway girl gangs that had a general aesthetic that they clung to, but never ever dared to dress the same as their girl group counterparts. Then came three looks, like a bright color-coded pack, where Claudia Schiffer and Karen Mulder wore similar orange and yellow blazers, while Linda Evangelista wore a pink and dark purple blazer with a pink tee and belt to match. I mean, Linda's jacket is beautiful, it's true. But an interesting tidbit, and one of the core codes of the Versailles 
Versace house was the matching leather pants each of the models wore. Previous to my research about Versace, I thought that he was just a tacky Italian who slopped references and fabrics together in whatever way he saw fit. But through research, I found that Gianni was incredibly active in the creation of not only his garments, but his textiles as well. Italy went through a manufacturing renaissance after World War II, and Gianni took advantage of this and found the best textile mills and took them to task. He began to experiment with his own leathers, but after a newfound respect for the textile, after he sent a white blouse and leather pants set to Diana Vreeland, the editor of American Vogue from 1963 to 1971. She wore the look and sent him a photo, which changed his opinion on older women and how they could actually pull off materials many only subscribed to young Younger women. From there, Gianni took his leathers very seriously and they became a large part of his collections while also intertwining with his love of rock and roll and American athleisure. Then came a section of looks that mixed a lot of Gianni's favorite styles and historical references together. He had recently gotten into the idea of screen printing and creating his own imagery, essentially mixing many different styles of art from Baroque to art pop. He had looks that took Greek symbolism and figures and gave them an art pop twist by putting them in bright jewel tones and giving them harsh black outlines like cartoons. He created cat suits with floral Baroque inspired meandering vines crawling up the model's legs and chests, but mixed them with black and white or black and yellow tweed suit jackets, which could have been a reference and ode to Coco Chanel and his friend and mentor, Karl Lagerfeld. Again, we see Gianni's appropriative style that didn't want to steal ideas, but more so give a Versace twist. So instead of the gold buttons with the signature Chanel double C or a camellia, it had the Versace Medusa head in that royal gold. Then we get a few silk looks that were printed with images of Roman Catholic popes collaged together in bright and saturated colors. Gianni grew up as a Catholic and fashion to him even growing up revolved around his religion as well. Seeing as how his mother would perform the sign of the cross before she cut patterns or fabrics. And like, honestly, same. I used to do the sign of the cross when trying to catch Pokemon when I was like seven. So I get it. And it's even crazier to see how he mixed these quite faith-filled prints with what would have been at the time referred to as hooker boots. We would call them thigh highs today, but the name for the time really shows what people thought of the style. But now we're pro sex workers, so if you're not, unsubscribe. Yes, Gianni was unafraid of embracing sexuality in all aspects, and he had no problem mixing these still pretty taboo subjects with his brand and story. I mean, the man came out publicly in a positive manner during a 1995 advocate interview and like, if I, if that's not, you know, gay liberation, I don't know what is. When looking at these two components of Gianni's design aesthetic with his own personal life, it's hard not to notice how brilliantly irreverent this Italian Roman Catholic really was. And personally, I really applaud him for it. This also happens to be where these gold Baroque prints jut in again. And I'll be honest, from the research I've done, I cannot define a particular look that starts the ready to wear transition in this collection, but it seems these Baroque prints are the best source of that change for now. Now, Baroque, for those of you that don't know, was a style of design, which ranged from art to architecture to textiles that started in Rome in the 1600s. So, Italian history, Gianni Versace, it's just kind of a match made in heaven. The aesthetic was quite popular for its dramatic style, which played with the ideas of light and dark, hence the dark background and bright gold vines and leaves, as well as its fine detail, which contributed to the exaggerated manner that so many loved it for. In the book, The Versace Legend, Patrizia Cuoco, Gianni's personal assistant, noted that unintentionally the print became iconic and that Gianni didn't even realize that it would become a signature for the house. But the other thing is he also put so much work into it that just one of those meandering vines has 16 different colors in it. That's how detailed the man was. And I mean, even today, if you think about it, what covers the Versace runways always? And then we got a clash of clans as Versace introduced juxtaposition tartans and plaids that came in neat and petite skirt suits. They had velvet stockings that matched one of the many colors on their jackets and skirts. And while velvet had historically been a luxurious fabric, it holds a particularly special place in Italy as the textile historically became a great export from cities like Genoa, Florence, and Milan. 
Versace's love of the Renaissance could have led him to a love of high-end velvets as well. While I haven't found much info on why Versace was drawn to these quite Scottish styles, it definitely is interesting to see that Scottish Highland culture could seep into an Italian house's inspirations. Then came Linda Evangelista and Karen Mulder, who trounced out in tight-fitted pants printed full of Baroque jewelry and crosses. The styles are quite gaudy, but so was the Baroque period of art that lasted until 1775. While Versace had no problem creating costume jewelry versions of these historic pieces, he also modernized them by screen printing them, almost making these invaluable pieces obtainable for his clients. Then came a slew of all black looks that were quite simple yet sexy, as was the Versace woman's way. Although they were decked out in costume jewelry in that same Baroque style, there were belts and necklaces in gold with big bright stones. But the best part in my mind are the downturned knee-high boots that are stoned in gold. Like, I would die for him. The cupped bras in the jackets are something that have also been resurrected since Donatella Versace has been looking into Gianni's archives for recent collections. See? You can tell, you can, yeah, you know. It's very apparent, it's very real, it's very much so happening. Then came a round of faille dresses, but because this was ready to wear, Gianni used the shiny fabric not throughout the entirety of the dress, but as a way to sculpt the body. A yellow dress uses the opposing fabrics as a way to create a princess seam style, while the black and pink dresses utilize the faille with exposed and hidden godets. The two dresses, again, are almost reciprocals of each other, with the pink putting the godet on display display, while the black is more conservative and shields the black thigh underneath. And Christy dazzled in an orange thigh dress that had the orange fabric towards the hem, lift on one side to highlight blue silk thigh underneath. Like, the man's mind. Sache color blocking was in full effect here. Then came a rainbow of models wearing monochromatic cardigans with pleated skirts and signature Versace strap tops. They also had matching leggings and shoes. Now you may have seen multiple models walking together. And this was no accident, as I said earlier. By the time the early 1990s had rolled around, Gianni Versace had been in the business for some time. And during the 80s, when Gianni was in the infancy of his house, he'd become quite well known for sending those multiple models down the catwalk at the same time. Now, I've already said that, but while other designers might have also sent two to three models down the runway at once, which Gianni just did on the regular, not many big houses were sending four to six girls down the runway like a regular girl gang. Like, watch out. Like, they might have a baseball bat underneath one of those pleated skirts. You don't know. Then we started to see quite a bit of leather jackets being shown on the runway, which correlated to Gianni's upbringing and love of all things rock and roll. The leather jacket has an interesting history, and while resources are not sure on the exact origin, it seems to have begun as a coat worn by German pilots during World War I. But the jackets came into a less political popularity when a Harley-Davidson motorcycle distributor asked Irving Schott to design the leather jacket to his specifications. The jacket added a zipper instead of the normal buttons, as well as shortening it from its military specifications. After the Second World War, America had a youth culture shift that began to revolve around fast cars and rock and roll. And one James Dean actually catapulted the shot leather jacket to fame due to his role in the movie The Wild Ones, where he sat on a motorcycle wearing the jacket. Towards the 1970s and 80s, the jacket began to pick up steam in the punk rock crowd and was a favorite of the Ramones, Blondie, Joan Jett, and the Sex Pistols. Gianni no doubt grew up seeing the coats everywhere, and it most likely was revered as the pinnacle of cool, as America's grasp on media was and still is quite powerful globally. Gianni sent a simple leather bomber jacket down the runway with some color block pleated skirts just to show clients he could do simple. But from there, his leather jackets were drugged through rhinestones and crystals that created patterns on the jacket's sleeves and back. One jacket worn by supermodel Linda Evangelista even had a stone version of what looks like Duccio's Madonna and Child on the back of her jacket. Gianni loved Andy Warhol's work and this irreverent imagery of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus on the back of a leather jacket that had long represented loose morals was definitely pushing the envelope and playing into the juxtaposition that Gianni loved. 
and that was central to the Versace brand. Then came a gaggle of Baroque printed silk looks that became synonymous with Versace. As we already mentioned, Gianni loved history and especially loved the Baroque period. He had been exploring prints since he was a child, and these gold meandering foliage prints just exuded this luxurious feeling, while the black played to the sensual and mature notions that a Versace woman displayed. It mixed luxury with mystery, and nowadays many would say being mysterious to the outside world is the ultimate luxury. Two of the looks were belted to create shape, while the others were a skin tight catsuit and silky day dress. Dress it up or dress it down, the one thing that you must do with a Versace look is make it sexy. One last thing to note on these Baroque prints is Gianni was always trying to update and change his styles when it came to the prints. He in past collections had no problem changing the colors, adding leopard prints, cow spots, or 60s graphics. But for him to send down quite simple and understated prints like this must have meant something. Then came the real reason we are talking about the show. The runway moment that cemented the word supermodel in the lexicon of pop culture for decades to come. But actually, it didn't start with a runway. It all started on the cover of the January 1990 British Vogue shot by Peter Lindbergh. Lindbergh had photographed five models. Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, Tatiana Paditz, Christy Turlington, and Cindy Crawford. After seeing the cover, the famed British musician George Michael cast four of the five women in his Freedom 90 music video. Linda Evangelista is sitting on the floor lip syncing the song, while Naomi dances around the barren loft with headphones on. Christy walks around draped in a gigantic sheet, and Cindy touches herself in a steaming hot bath. The song and music video was a hit and highlighted each of the models' beauty while also showing their abilities to not just be one-note models. Gianni had already realized that these models were a major advertising magnet, and so he had the four girls who had starred in the video walk down the runway separately in pleated dresses lip-syncing the song. They walked separately at the beginning, but then joined together to do a final walk in that Versace style. And that walk was reported to have cost a rumored 100,000 US dollars at the time which is pricey. Now, many believe that this section of the show was actually the finale of the collection, and I mean, I get why, seeing as it was actually a moment in fashion that has gone down in history, and I mean, like, listen, if you saw the four girls walk together lip-syncing to the Freedom Nines, you all, it makes sense why you'd think that was the end, but it actually wasn't. A whole batch of black sexy bodycon styles that were quintessential Versace came out right after. It started with a beautiful yet severe cowl neck cocktail dress. It's a quite modern take on a style that can feel very old and outdated easily, and it still holds up even 20 years later, like I would wear it. And then Marpessa Henning came out in a dress that was similar, but instead of a cowl neck, it had a draped neckline that showed the bright yellow lining of the dress. But the most interesting part of the dress was that the black dress actually had a blue mini skirt underneath, which made the black dress on top almost appear as if it was being peeled off by Marpessa's body. It almost feels like a metaphor for the way people dress. You can wear all black and adhere to societal values, but if you really want to show your true self, all you have to do is peel back that layer and let your colors shine, your freak flag fly, your... I don't have any other phases, but you know, be yourself. This is very weirdly positive for Hall of the Moon, and I don't really know why. Then came two similar black gowns, one with a quite striking asymmetrical backless style, but the other had a sweetheart butt line. Yeah, that's the only other way I can describe a neckline for your butt, a butt line. We need more of those. It is actually a quite comical little style and would certainly attract the more irreverent of Versace's clients. Then Linda Evangelista came out in the stunning T-bar turtleneck gown with an orange faille bustier underneath. Then Christy Turlington came out in a black keyhole cutout gown with a green faille bustier, which is a dress I would pay to have the body for. I would, I really, I really truly would. Naomi donned a similar look, except her keyhole was filled to the brim with a crystallized bra. Then Marpessa Henning stole the show again in a black dress that has one of the sexiest slits on the planet which seems to have been laced together with just two strings. I'm like, okay, I'm here for it. Their dress is also two-toned in black as the front looks like more of a matte fabric while the back of the dress was in that gorgeous velvet. And again, reference back to early Gianni Versace. He loves a black velvet dress. It was one of the first things that he ever remembers about fashion. The last six looks of the collection are so major and are such defining looks for Versace. First, Cindy Crawford came out in an all-black motorcycle jacket and pleated skirt, only to rip it off to reveal a crystal bust. 
The bust had what looked like different vinyl records. Some said AM, maybe in reference to AM radio, or simply the word music scrawled in shiny crystals. Gourmet Cower did the same thing in her black look, except her dress's bust was decorated with little dancers in red, green, and blue. Then Nadege de Bosporus came out in a black motorcycle jacket with Baroque crosses embellished on it. But her dress had Mary and her son Jesus memorialized in crystals. Gianni loved a Madonna moment. He really did. Then Yasmin Gauri did a reveal that gave us a pink, yellow, and green T-bar bust budding with flowers. Linda Evangelista's dress celebrated music, theater, and art in what is most definitely a crystal monstrosity, but Versace wanted it to be gaudy and irreverent, so like who am I to judge? Between the guitar that creates the illusion of a strap, an image of the play Salome that is about the beheading of John the Baptist, and the insane color blocking, there is a lot to take in. But it's so obviously Versace was not only interested in the whimsical, but also the dark side of the world as well. And so the man had death. Good for him. And finally, Christy Turlington closed the show out in a crystal bra and jacket adorned with faces in a Greek style that Versace had loved. It was the perfect way to end the show and modernize ancient history in a garment. Gianni took his bow with all the models walking him down the runway, but he held hands with Christy Turlington and Linda Evangelista as they both kissed him. For the first time exploring Gianni's work, it's amazing to see his bountiful inspirations and references, and how he has changed the way we see fashion as an art form. On top of that, his mind in terms of advertising by using the supers is evident here, as well as his ability to put on a moment that has gone down in both modeling and fashion history. In reality, my appreciation for Gianni Versace and the Versace brand has gone from zero to hundred very, very fast. I would love to know what you guys thought of this collection down in the comments below and Versace in general. I really learned a lot and hopefully we can explore more Versace collections because honestly, there are a lot that I actually want to talk about now. So thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you guys in the next video and TTYL.